uh, and uh, let's start with the presentation. So uh, just uh, a remark. So please be careful in uh, stay within 12 minutes uh, because the scheduling is very tight and we'd like to uh, have the, the time for the evaluation before the um, award ceremony at half past one. Uh, and um, yeah, please consider for, for ha having a more homogeneous evaluation the committee decided to skip the questions after each presentation, so we can be um, I mean, more more uh, homogeneous in uh, evaluating the presentation. So let's start from uh, uh, the first uh, team uh, should be softer is better, and the leader should be Camillo Puccio. So please, Camillo, can start. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, um, yes, I will start uh, sharing uh, my presentation. Uh, so, share. Okay, C can you see this? Yes. Yeah, now I'm in full screen mode. Do you hear me well? Sorry, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so I'm going to start. I am the team leader of the Soft Better is team, Better is better team, and uh, uh, my teammates are uh, Abdika Di Rova Banu from uh, UMA Summers, Barta Vici Lorenzo from uh, Firenze University, and uh, Rondoni Elena Hirari, uh, who is from uh, Campus Biomedical University, uh, just as uh, me. With uh, this presentation, I will uh, introduce you to the concept of a new assistive rehabilitative and augmenting technology that we call the S-cubed or uh, the stiff soft sole. So uh, where to start? The locomotion, as uh, you all know, is one of the, the most important functions that uh, serve uh, survival and uh, interaction in humans. And uh, uh, gait requires uh, a huge coordination of uh, limbs and muscles, uh, multisensory fusion, and so is a complex task for uh, the central nervous uh, system. Uh, the interaction between the foot and the ground that generates the so-called ground reaction forces is a crucial aspect of the human gait. As a matter of fact, the development and the optimization of outdoor shows has always been carried out by industries and there exists a noticeable amount of research on this subject. In recent years, it has been discovered that uh, the bending of uh, the forefoot uh, causes dissipation of uh, energy during uh, tasks like uh, running, sprinting, and uh, jumping. Um, by, uh, it has been demonstrated how by increasing the um, solar longitudinal bending stiffness, uh, one could uh, reduce the amount uh, of uh, energy that uh, is lost in uh, these tasks, uh, while uh, other studies uh, provided, uh, proved that the need uh, for uh, variable stiffness shows uh, in order to assist subjects uh, during a gait. For instance, uh, patients uh, with uh, uh, knee osteoarthritis uh, showed uh, reduced uh, adduction moment and pain tends to the use of these variable stiffness shows, uh, which uh, um, so consequently um, changes in the, the uh, ground reaction forces and uh, of uh, um, the center of pressure were uh, obtained with uh, these uh, shoes. So given the importance of uh, conducting studies uh, on the benefits of uh, different stiffness, um, uh, an over system called the, the variable stiffness treadmill has been designed. And uh, this device is capable of uh, controlling load feedback uh, stimulus by regulating uh, the walking surface uh, stiffness in real time. Uh, it is uh, possible to obtain a broad range of uh, stiffness with uh, this device with high resolution and accuracy. 
and uh, as well as the ability uh, to uh, regulate uh, the stiffness within the stance phase of walking. And uh, these are some of the unique characteristics of uh, the VST. Uh, and this device uh, proved itself to be an enabling technology for better understanding of human gait and to create uh, new avenues for rehabilitation. In fact, the repeatability and scalability of the evoked muscle activity by means of uh, this device proved the possibility of uh, using working around stiffness perturbation in gait rehabilitation that could be applied, uh, for example, to the hemiplegic stroke patients and uh, other impaired uh, workers in uh, general. So here is where the s cubed comes into play. Um, based on the evidence of uh, variable ground stiffness benefits, we conceptualized a wearable device that exploits a jamming mechanism embedded in uh, the sole of the shoes that uh, automatically changes its stiffness depending on uh, the um, phase of uh, the gait cycle. Uh, so, uh, the system also, also includes a backpack for uh, the housing of actuation and control components, such as uh, pumps for creating the vacuum, um, tubes, and uh, electronics to process signals coming from uh, two uh, switch sensors uh, placed, on the, placed on the sole that serve to detect different gate phases, of course. Uh, so our idea is uh, to obtain higher stiffness uh, when uh, the um, heel leaves uh, the ground and uh, uh, lower stiffness when the heel strikes the ground in order to damp the impact and prevent uh, damage to the joints of the user. So in order to prove our concept, uh, firstly, we decided to employ the Geyer uh, muscle reflex uh, model, model to simulate the effects of several gram stiffness on the joint angles and uh, torques. Uh, so uh, this particular model is well known for its accuracy in representing uh, human uh, locomotion and uh, the um, main features of this model are the segmented uh, legs that are used instead of springs of the more common, more known bipedal spring mass model. And uh, stance behavior is generated by extensor muscles connected to the knee and the ankle. Uh, then uh, a trunk has been added to this model in order uh, to replace the point mass and uh, it is balanced uh, 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 with the adapt added hip muscles in, uh, in the model. Um, the uh, overall, this model uh, showed, proved to be uh, uh, more rob robust to uh, ground uh, disturbances, uh, can generate working dynamics and uh, like kinematics, and uh, adapt uh, to the ground slopes without uh, parameter intervention. So uh, this model confirmed our hypothesis on the potentiality of a variable stiffness uh, uh, to greatly reduce the torque set to the knee angle. But if you were to I ask the other members of the bow to speak frankly, they might admit that this had been the first time ever that Reina, who had traveled with only her father. Sorry, what's happening? Okay. No problem, go ahead. <laughs> Somebody okay. had the, the microphone. Okay. So uh, yes, what I was saying, uh, what we um, what we saw with our uh, simulation is, uh, uh, as you can see from this graph here, is that uh, actually a softer ground in uh, the initial uh, uh, cycle moment, namely the heel strike, significantly reduces uh, the uh, torque at the knee joint. Then the heel off could be uh, used, the toe off, sorry, 
could be uh, used. Uh, no, sorry, this is the uh, ill of the, the slide is wrong, and uh, it it could be uh, used uh, at uh, the, um, as a trigger for the stiffening of the soul, and uh, because an higher stiffness does not influence so much the torque in the space. So uh, uh, it is it is possible to exploit the, the sub thin and uh, uh, higher stiffness to um, <clears throat> uh, to obtain the significant reduction of uh, the um, of the torque in the tibia vertical uh, moment. Uh, simulations were run with uh, four different values of ground stiffness and um, uh, the um, joint angles, joint moments, and uh, mean muscular activation of uh, the stride were uh, saved, as uh, you can see. So, uh, coming to the assignments of uh, the workshops, uh, according to the workflow uh, for the system design, we first decided to assess uh, which are the best materials uh, to be used for creating the jamming mechanism. Uh, uh, so we just uh, depended uh, a little bit here that uh, we produced uh, our assembled, assembled soul stiffening chamber system and uh, had tested it with uh, a tensile test. We imagined uh, testing the system in uh, the unjammed and jammed state in order to uh, evaluate its mechanical properties when it exhibits the two different uh, stiffness values. So um, to model the system stretching in relation to the forces applied, we used the hyperelastic models proposed during the first workshop that we attended. And uh, we uh, fitted the experimental curves reported here. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the model that best fits the first stomer is uh, the three term uh, Ammer, uh, where, whereas um, the first term Yeo and the Neo European have uh, showed to have proved to be the best fit for the second elastomer. Uh, as you can see, for the, from the um, parameters of uh, fitting, like uh, root mean square and um, uh, so, uh, and others that are showed in uh, the bottom of the slide. Of course, uh, uh, what we uh, Amino, you here... have uh, less than two minutes left. Okay, so let me let me go on. Uh, for uh, the second assignment, uh, we uh, tested the S cube sole bending properties. Uh, since uh, we want to use uh, the, the hill of event as the trigger for uh, the stiffening mechanism, we uh, decided to use uh, the methods proposed in the, the second workshop to model the sole deformation. Uh, so here we tailored a little bit the, the data that were given from for the assignment. We changed the, the shape to, the, to one that is more similar to, to our device. And uh, we even changed the, the forces and the young modulus. And uh, here uh, we can see the plot of uh, uh, the position of uh, the tip, which is the heel of uh, our soul in the, the y, in uh, y, x uh, uh, plane uh, related with the forces that were applied to the, to the free end of, uh, the, of the beam. Uh, finally, for uh, the assignment three, we uh, just uh, um, tried uh, to uh, simulate the deformation of our uh, soft object, uh, um, changing the values of uh, lambda, which is uh, the um, actual, uh, stretch, uh, actual stretch ratio. And uh, uh, what we... Uh, obtained is that uh, when uh, we, we compared the uh, two results for uh, lambda equal 1.5 and lambda equal 0.5 to the results obtained where the lambda is equal to one, that means that uh, the uh, stretch, uh, the actual stretch uh, is neglected. And uh, uh, what we found out is that uh, if lambda is equal to one, the soft links 
undergo radial contraction, uh, becoming more slender, and uh, uh, so the actuating pressure causes wider displacement. Uh, while when lambda is lower than one, the links undergo a radial expansion, becoming more bulky and uh, reducing the displacements of the end refractor. So uh, let me conclude be, for the sake of time. Uh, we can say that uh, variable stiffness shows can have significant benefit for the rehabilitation and augmentation. In our uh, simulation, the stiffness has been held constant during uh, uh, working. However, a more realistic simulation can be carried out, um, including uh, variable stiffness during time. And uh, so on, the experimental stuff will be improved. And uh, the, um, some optimization techniques uh, may be uh, used to uh, optimize uh, uh, stiffness curve for each subject. So we, we are thinking of a, a really um, personalized uh, um, device. So uh, the slideshow is over and uh, thank you everyone for the, for the attention. Thanks Camillo um, uh, for the presentation and all the team. So let's go to the second team. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the attention. Thank you. Again. So, we yeah, are uh, Giant Unde is the leader. Please, can you can start? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, and can and we can see the slide. So please start. Okay. So very good morning to all. My name is Giant, and I'm the team leader for the team number two, Exosop, uh, Exosop team. So first of all, I'd like to take opportunity to thank all the organizers for this wonderful, uh, wonderful Pi Day seasonal school, uh, which definitely added a lot more tool in our arsenal for our future careers. So without wasting any time, uh, I'll go through the presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce my team, which is composed of me as a leader, and Lingen, Maxwell, Lorenzo, and Martina. So this is a brief uh, outline uh, of the presentation. I'll go through background, then the project concept, what is the novelty of the project, then our ambition for the future implementation. And we will also relate the topic uh, uh, project with the school topics. Then we go through the project implementation and finally the conclusion. So uh, we all know that exoskeleton uh, systems uh, either aim at enhancing healthy wearers physical strength with robotic actuation or aim at providing rehabilitation therapies for neuromuscular defects uh, after uh, stroke uh, or the spinal cord injury. So, so the use of rigid links in exoskeleton could be justified in application for strength augmentation or take uh, external excessive load or shield the wearer. So, but the use of rigid link also introduces some drawbacks such as the system bulkiness, high inertia, difficulty in main maintaining kinematic compatibility between exoskeleton and the wearer. Also in rehabilitation clinic, uh, we observe that uh, where the rigid link exoskeleton uh, is often shared with the group of patient, it is difficult and inconvenient for the therapist to adjust the exoskeleton from time to time to make sure that it fits every patient well. So it might be necessary to specifically design an exoskeleton for rehabilitation using compliant elements so that the ideal exoskeleton could automatically confirm to different patient anatomies and provide consistent therapies. If more design requirement could be imposed such as for such ideal exoskeleton, it should be light, it should be comfortable to wear, it should be cheap to manufacture and compact. So it should be a portable for a remote or home therapies. So this is the brief background of the, our project. Uh, so in this slide, I'll report some example of uh, shoulder exoskeleton, which incorporates a compliant continuum mechanism. And continuum mechanism uh, could passively deform itself up to accommodate different patient anatomies while providing pure assistance when the patient has no or little motor capabilities. The flexible continuum shoulder brace is given by a push pull motion of the backbone, and these push pull motions are generated with two degrees of freedom actuation unit, in the as we can see in the slide. So, shoulder base brace is actuated to assist adduction, abduction the flexion and extension uh, motion of upper arm. So to go forward with the project concept and its relation to the school topics. So on the basis of previous work and knowledge gained during the past few days, 
we took inspiration from shoulder exoskeleton that I already showed. We want to propose a similar device which could use to perform rehabilitation therapy to recover flexion and extension joint mobilities. Our device can be used for both elbow, upper limb, and uh, for the knee, lower limb. Then as uh, we will show in the future development, this divide can also be a modular. So it enables possibility of connecting two devices together with rigid links and uh, finally obtain a device which could simultaneously use for uh, rehabilitation of elbow and wrist uh, and for knee and ankle together. So our idea is, okay, I'll go to the next slide. Okay, so this is the project implementation uh, slide. So our methodology that we followed uh, is reported in this slide. So first we thought about the general application of cable driven soft devices. Once rehabilitation field of application was chosen, we concentrated on the mechanical design of the device structure. Based on the assignment of the workshop, we perform analysis and curve fitting of the proposed material to understand which could be the methodology to choose the hyperelastic material for our application. Then we use Soros SIM toolbox to design the exoskeleton and we are going to report the result uh, of the developed structure for this particular project with preliminary simulation. Unfortunately though, we cannot uh, able to run the simulation for the last toolbox introduced, which was TMTDYN because of the technical errors offering in the MATLAB code that we cannot go through because of the less time. The last toolbox, but however, we can incorporate this toolbox based on the package to automate derivation of TMT equation of motion for the hybrid rigid continuum body dynamics of the system that we propose based on the constraint, contacts, linear model analysis, non-linear controller design. And this could be exploited in future development of uh, the proposed project. So project implementation, uh, I'll go through the workshop one first. So in order to choose the material uh, most appropriate, we go through the assignments that provided for the uh, workshop one. We thought about the requirement that our system material should have so we selected material uh, pro which provides higher stress or the same strain value. In figure, the stress strain curves are shown for the pro provided elastomers. We selected elastomer uh, two, and therefore we were able to solve uh, assignment number one point, uh, workshop 1.3 and 1.4. So in this slide, you can see the numerical result uh, and plots of comparison between your one-term model uh, and Ogden one-term model. You can see that the curve fitting is not precise and our value shows that. Moreover, we reported that values obtain uh, coefficient to fit the experimental data. So similarly, we performed the analysis for two other model, which is muni rivlin theta model and EO theta model. Numerical result about the goodness of fit uh, and obtain coefficient for the curve fitting are shown in the table, as well as the equation uh, to fit the experimental data. On the basis of our analysis, the model which fits the better for elastomer two, which we chose for our project, was the muni rivlin uh, three model hyperelastic model. So for workshop two assignment, we chose to do workshop assignment ID number 2.3 because it was similar to our idea of soft actuated links, which possesses a uh, continuum exoskeleton. So in order to finish the simulation of uh, actuated soft arm, firstly, we built a link model uh, with two division in Soros in toolbox and set all the dimensions as per the assignment, uh, two built in tendon routing parts, uh, soft arm according to table assignment, uh, which is shown in 2.3. Then for the physical properties, we just choose the default values. So for simulation part, we choose 10 Gaussian point for the proximal division, which has a twice uh, length compared to the distal segment and five Gaussian point for the distal segment. In order to avoid excessively computational cost, we choose two bending degrees of freedom, one torsion degrees of freedom uh, as a de deformation degrees of freedom. So, and we neglect all the external loads and only include the gravity. So you can see the uh, dynamic simulation of workshop 2.3. So for as for the project implementation using Sorosim uh, of continuum exoskeleton that we propose, in fact, it is a sing, sig, signal segment continuum mechanism that we use to push pull, uh, push pull elastic rods, which are shown in the red color and two, uh, two rigid rods which which uh, not rigid but uh, the compliant rods shown in the blue colors so th these are just to maintain the planar uh, plane of the device so we built the system uh, this complete system in sorosim model uh, 
uh, sorus uh, environment and with specified dimension and elastic properties that we chose uh, earlier. So this page shows the static simulation of our project because we only make the segment to realize a planar bending motion. We only need one degree of freedom. And we chose the order three basis function for this to simulate. So we simulate two cases with different actuation force pair as shown in the picture. The continuum segment could bend in two opposite direction. Uh, we further check the calculator deflection result and find uh, the last two values segment joint is very close to zero, which means the segment exhibit constant curvature. So this also provides widely accepted constant curvature assumption, which is verified by the experiments and other theoretical investigations. So we uh, in the final- uh, You have uh, uh, three final minutes left. Yeah, sure. Uh, we also able to do the dynamic simulation of proposed uh, continuum model, as we can see in the slide, the video. So we apply the slope function uh, provided in this table and uh, force input for the two push-pull rods. The continuum segment could generate bending uh, motion as we require. So in conclusion, uh, to conclude all the things together, uh, we want to illustrate the next design step of the further future development of uh, the project. First, we need to, uh, we could analyze in depth for our mechanical structure that we propose, perform some additional simulation, choose the proper materials, then we could include uh, in the device, the possibility of connecting uh, two devices together with the help of rigid links and convert into a, a unique structure to supply, uh, support the combined rehabilitation of elbow and wrist or knee and ankle joint together. So in order to develop modular continuum uh, rehabilitation uh, device. So potentialities for the proposed idea include the possibility to overcome drawback introduced by the use of rigid link in the exoskeleton, uh, which is which, uh, current exoskeletons for rehabilitation purposes and allow the device to conform uh, with different patient anatomies while providing the consistent therapies. So this device could be applied to the patient uh, with neuromuscular and musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, our expected impact is that this type of device could contribute to define new generation of exoskeleton to use in daily rehabilitation clinics and in-home uh, in work of the devices. So this is all from our side. Thank you for your attention and thank you. Well, thank you very much also for uh, uh, being uh, in time and also saving uh, more than one minute. So thanks to you and the team. And let's go to the next uh, presentation that should be given by the, the Tulani Tzabet. Um, that is the uh, team leader of Soft T team. So please, you can share the slide. Sure, so I'm uh... okay. We can hear you and we can also see the slides. So, perfect. You can, uh, you can start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, we are Team Softy, so we are presenting an arm assistive uh, orthosis. So, I'll briefly introduce uh, uh, our team. Uh, so, our team is uh, uh, contributed of uh, EMEA from IIT, uh, Isabel from Ibero, Marco from University of Padua, and Sarah from Campus University Biomedical Roma, and myself from University of Nevada, Reno. So uh, there has been a lot of work uh, documenting the, the, the productivity or the amount of, of assistance that comes from robotics. Uh, exoskeleton in particular, they provide a lot of um, uh, benefits uh, in the rehab uh, space. But rigid exoskeleton, uh, they tend to be big, they tend to be bulky uh, and heavy. While the improvements uh, are certainly there, they tend to limit uh, the set of movement uh, to be applied in daily uh, life tasks. Uh, more than that, uh, the design uh, sort of uh, considerations requires that you, know, you match uh, perfectly the kinematic uh, rotation or movement of the joints with the device. And that, uh, if that is not met, the safety of the user can be very limited. In addition, as you can see in these videos that are currently play, playing as well, it's a little bit uh, tricky to put them on. Uh, uh, more often than not, you definitely need assistance uh, for that. Uh, on the other side, soft exoskeleton, uh, exoskeleton they provide uh, a lot more sort of advantage and uh, actually freedom. On the first cases that you know they are very lightweight, that means that they, they can be easily worn by the patients 
but also uh, can be in integrated uh, fairly seamlessly to uh, the activities of daily living, not just for patients, but also for uh, uh, healthy individuals that are just looking for that extra bit of assistance, uh, whether we are talking about soldiers in the field or just normal running uh, on gate. Uh, this is mainly because of the low mass uh, of inertia, uh, sort of uh, of this compactness of these systems as well, and how easy they can actually uh, adapt to to our uh, human human anatomy. Uh, so, uh, spinal cord injury is actually uh, one of the the main uh, injuries that exists in the world uh, uh, right now. I think in the US, uh, it's uh, it's definitely on the rise. And one of the things that happens with uh, SCI is that you know. Uh, if, they can, if patients can use their arm, it tends to be that you know, most of these loads tend to be concentrated on the upper body uh, arm to be able to actually move. Um, and that means you know, uh, the loads actually increase, uh, the, the range of motion can be limited. Uh, in fact, uh, it turns out that 50% you know, of SCI uh, patients develop shoulder pain within a few years uh, of having a spinal cord injury. So these sort of increased loading can actually affect what the people can do in terms of their uh, uh, activities of daily living and can uh, greatly reduce the independence uh, as a result. So with that in mind, I uh, introduce to you SOFT. Uh, SOFT is a, a tendon driven uh, system that consists of a soft support material uh, and has a cantilever beam that I will talk a little bit uh, uh, more about in the next slide. But one of the uh, things to consider here is that, you know, we have this sort of support system that allows for a uh, nice and comfortable fit to the user. And as you can see on the uh, diagram on the, on, on, on the right, basically you see the amount of forces that we expect uh, to be able to provide in terms of assistance uh, for this device. So uh, having introduced SOFT, I'm going to give uh, a little bit of more sort of overall architecture, how we envision this device working. So it consists of three modules, the sensing module control and also actuation. Digging a little bit better on the, on the actuation, right? Uh, we are using tendon drive. So for this, we have the encoder for uh, one sort of uh, 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 a feedback uh, measurement. But more than that, we also do use EMG to sort of try to determine the user intention so that we can provide the necessary assistance in terms of what the user is actually doing. But uh, in addition, we are using this cantilever beam that I just sort of introduced before uh, as, a mechanical, um, as a mechanical sensor as well. So there are some conductive elastomers that already exist. So we, we envision that this, we can use the deformation of it to sort of come up with uh, a measurement of how much the movement uh, actually has actually occurred for this device. Uh, and this basically is as simple as sort of uh, using a simple voltage divider to determine as the length and the deformation changes, uh, so will the resistance of this, uh, of this elastomer. Uh, and we take some of our inspiration uh, from the, the talks that we've sort of listened in the last four days. Uh, in this slide, I'll go a little bit uh, more details in terms of why or what, what the motivation is when we're thinking about this device. One, one of the, uh, the main things that sort of, uh, sort of uh, highlighted in these talks is that you know, we, we, as, you divide, as you design divide devices that we need for wearable, uh, the sensing mechanism or the sensor that exists actually are not entirely suited uh, for this. What we mean by this you know, is for rigid robots, we want, for instance, if we want to measure the rotation, we can have sensors that can easily be collocated with the position or the movement of the joint. But if you're talking about the shoulder or the wrist, uh, that becomes a little bit more uh, 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 sort of difficult to do. So uh, coming up with sensing mechanisms that can sort of help with that uh, actually become key. So researchers have used different uh, approaches with this, whether it's uh, IMUs to determine how the, the accelerations of the muscles and then use that sort of extrapolate amount of angle of movement. And this also becomes key uh, essentially because uh, of one of the issues, which is the migration or the movement of the devices compared to comfort, right? So if the device moves a little bit, now you actually need to know where that is so that you can apply the appropriate forces. Otherwise you end up applying more assistance forces uh, than naturally what the user needs. And the other inspiration of going down the tendon drive is that Dr. Cho uh, has done extensive work and presented some of the advantages of tendon drive. Uh, this system is not only compact and lightweight, but it also has some also nice pro properties like uh, slick management mechanisms. Um, so instead of having to apply energy all the time, you know, we can actually afford to go slack, 
because this is assistance. And that means, you know, we can have devices that you can use on demand without actually limiting uh, the range of motion or the activities that the user can actually do. And so this allows, you know, to uh, sort of miniaturize this system and make them a lot lightweight uh, and actually applicable in this device I want to do. And finally, Dr. Johnson talked uh, about the, the interplay between comfort and trust with devices and robots. Um, and so having these sort of multiple or three sensing modalities, which is the encoding, the encoder, the mechanical sensor that we are proposing, and then the EMG, we have enough redundancy to make sure that the device always acts as the user wishes. Uh, because any wrong uh, application of this might uh, deteriorate uh, either the usage of this uh, uh, exoskeleton on this device, and that is uh, not uh, ideal. So in terms of the assignments, you know, it is key for us, uh, especially if we want to use this as a sensing mechanism to come up with a close form relation between the stretch uh, and the stress. Uh, and from our workshop number three, basically we, uh, we chose to apply the uh, Moonly Riven uh, three term and the Yo uh, three term as well. And as can be seen from this graph, you can sort of see that, you know, the, uh, the MR three term actually performs uh, better compared to this. Uh, but of course, the limitation is that, you know, both models have a fairly long analytical expression. But uh, it, with, with this clause form, we can then apply it to sort of uh, uh, know, predict in terms of the, the stretch that we expect for the forces that are actually uh, happening. Uh, and then finally, uh, we, we, for workshop two, we try to design the shape of these uh, sort of support and routing uh, soft material. So this soft uh, cantilever beam, basically, we want it to, uh, to be an ideal shape so that you know, it is stiff enough that it does provide some mechanical advantage in routing of the cables, but also it should be soft enough that we are able to get some significant movement so that we are able to use that as a feedback uh, for the position or infer the amount of uh, 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 movement that the, the, the device is actually undergone. Uh, so on the right, my video doesn't seem to be playing, but here yeah, I have friends basically these uh, in the beginning of the uh, configuration and at the end of the configuration. And so using this and the forces that I showed in the area slide, uh, we were able to design uh, in terms of what kind of shape that we're looking for and what kind of dimensions that could provide uh, something that is reasonable in terms of, uh, of the performance. You have three minutes left. And then uh, for, for, for the sensing, uh, basically, you know, uh, we, we are assuming UniXL for the test, we ran some UniXL tests. Uh, and from the, the key thing here is that we can actually use the incompressibility uh, to, to infer what the, uh, the, the stretches in the other dimensions are. Uh, and from this uh, workshop, basically, we're able to uh, sort of relate lambda to the stretch and deformation of the robot. So for instance, right, we want to be able to determine the cross section of the robot as we apply some forces as well. Uh, so you can see here that, you know, uh, we actually multiply uh, the, uh, the stretch with the, the diameter of the robot at the beginning. And so if lambda is one, then make sure that there, is, there are no changes there. And so we can apply any hyperelastic models that we want or we like and be able to determine uh, what kind of behavior that we want to see. Uh, and finally, with this device, basically, we are, we are able to design uh, a less complex and lightweight uh, soft uh, support material or uh, device that can actually help humans. Uh, and one of the things like with this soft uh, uh, sort of uh, addition that we're doing is that it can nicely fit to the human uh, as skeleton. And we hope that this will uh, enhance the quality of life of people. Uh, and sort of in terms of next step, one of the key things we have to test is you know, trying to uh, verify that the, 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 the resistance change of the PDMS, for instance, or uh, these conductive elastomers actually is reliable enough. Uh, there will be some considerations in terms of hysteresis and, and uh, in drift, but I think uh, having those three modalities is actually very important. And then we want to be able to do a quick uh, proof of concept to see uh, and optimize in terms of picking components and make sure that uh, we run some tests with subject as well. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you so much. It has been a very informative uh, and definitely uh, exciting, exciting week. Thank you very much. Also, in you know, staying within the time, you say it's thirty seconds. So thanks, um, and thanks uh, to uh, the rest of the team. So let's move to the next presentation.
uh, that uh, has to be given by uh, Cerere Hub team. Uh, the team leader should be uh, Emanuele Nicotra. Good morning, good morning to everyone. Can you hear me? Good, good morning, Emanuele. We can hear you. Uh, okay, I'm sharing the screen. Okay. So and you can see the slides and okay. you, can, you can start, please. Okay, in this project, we have uh, developed uh, an exogol enhanced with 3D printed soft sensor for non ambulatory children for rehabilitation with cere cerebral uh, palsy. Um, so, according to the ICF framework, the participation is a major inclusion in disabilities, and cerebral palsy is one of the one of the major disabilities for children. So. Um, for, for school age non ambulatory children um, with good cognitive skills and functions uh, on upper limb, uh, it is important and uh, it would improve their self confidence, inclusive, inclusive, inclusiveness in society uh, to uh, rehabilitate um, uh, due to the, their disabilities. Um, so uh, the project com the project concept is. Um, uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, target population, uh, children with cerebral palsy and nonverbal and non ambulatory. And so the goal is improving uh, the upper limb and, fin and finger sensor motor coordination and achieving functional tasks and carry out uh, ADLs uh, um, with schooling and communication and using smart devices with best uh, optimalities. So in the, in the picture, we, we can see how the um, the structure of the, the, the project is, uh, is based is um, at, at Exoglobe 3D printed with uh, a soft sensor on the tip of the fingers that can give um, uh, biofeedback to the patients in, in so as to improve the rehabilitation and the investing in the, the neuroplasticity of the, um, of the process. Uh, so, um, to relate the, the project to the school topics uh, for um, WS1, we choose to analyze and Im implement an elastomer for the search component. And uh, then we build, uh, built a finger like a tweeted soft link in Sorosim. And finally, we, we have used the TMT Dyne to derive the, the model and the equation of motion. So starting from the sensor, we were thought about uh, um, soft resistive sensor, which is made uh, of an elastomeric matrix that is filled with uh, conductive materials. Yeah, so, sorry. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay, so the, the material chosen for the sensor is a TPU, uh, conductive thermoplastic polyurethane with a carbon back filler, uh, which is called Ninja Tech uh, EEL. And um, the, the main uh, feature is that uh, it can be completely 3D printed in a single print. So um, in order to analyze the, the behavior of the material in, on the stress strain uh, curve, we have used the, we have used the three term Molly, Molly Rively model, and uh, we obtained uh, the stress strain curve uh, shown in the, in the slides. Um, how does it work? We have to understand how the, um, the electric resistance changes when the, the sensor. Um, stressed out tensor is uh, deformed. So um, knowing the surface resistivity of the material, um, we can uh, measure the resistance and fitting the, the its curve to the displacement of the, of the sensor. So um, the idea is that uh, while it, if the displacement increase, the contact area increases. And so um, by knowing the, the value of the surface resistivity, we can uh, estimate the electric resistance of the sensor, which uh, of course will decrease as the displacement increase. And so uh, the relationship is the one shown in the slides. And through this uh, relationship, we can also estimate the force and in sort of sense measure the, the force, uh, which um, is uh, uh, of course measured from the, the force of the sensor, we will give the, um, a signal to the, a controller that uh, um, itself will provide a, a soft haptic biofeedback for the, the patient. It uh, will improve this uh, uh, rehabilitation of, um, of the, the children. 
Um, so uh, here we can see how the, the sensor and the project can be implemented. Of course, there will be at least one, one sensor for fingers. And uh, the main feature is that is the uh, 3D printer uh, elastomer. And um, of course, uh, due to the, it's cheap and uh, easy to print, uh, it can be enhanced with a multiple array of sensor. Um, and also the globe will be 3D printed with a alpha bioflex filament, which uh, has also the medical certifications. And so it's, um, it's perfect. It's a perfect fit for the, for the globe. And of course, the more sensor will be present on the, the globe, the more the, the patients will, uh, will have the feedbacks in terms of first direction. Um, for the second assignment, so we choose to, um, to develop the WS 2.3 and uh, um, thinking about uh, a single finger of the exoglobe actuated by two cables and uh, by taking the, the data of the of the assignments so we can see how the simulation runs on uh, um, sorrow sim. Um, then we can uh, derive the model equation by using the TMT9 framework. And we have uh, we choose and the, the EBA or uh, Euler Bernoulli beams with absolute states since uh, for this um, for this simulation, we are not going to implement a control, uh, control design. And so uh, as the professor Halili said, it is the, the best model when the control design is not needed. In case of um, a more uh, accurate model is needed, uh, we can perform also a, um, uh, we can model the equation by using, for example, the ROM. Uh, model. Um, so we, we can also see in the slides the, um, the data that we have uh, used in the, in the software, which correspond, corresponds to the finger length, radius, and the census mass, uh, supposing that uh, there is a single sensor on the tip of the, of the finger. Um, these are the results of the TMT Dyne uh, software, which of course uh, are, are not complete for the sake of uh, uh, easiness of showing the, in the in the slides, and these are just two screenshots of the MATLAB up to functions, which are automatic generated from the, the TMT Dyne, and um, and by using this equation, we can uh, build the model and uh, use it for the, our purposes. Um, so the, the whole system is uh, can be seen in the system diagrams or um, where uh, the main controller uh, is able to, to take as input the EMG si signals from the mind wave and give a biofeedback with the soft vibrating actuator uh, and taking also as input, of course, the, the signal from the, from the sensor. And the controller is also able to actuate the, the exoglobe, which uh, in this case, we have thought about, uh, we have thought, the art, uh, we have thought of it as uh, nomadic uh, artificial, artificial muscle. And, um, and this is the old scheme. So in by the rehabilitation point of view, we can talk about the system as a closed loop on the brain. Uh, of course, uh, the task re repetition enhances neuroplasticity, which uh, at the end will um, improve the, the rehabilitation of the, of the patients. Um, so uh, for next step design, we have the uh, thought about a complete exoglobe design uh, as well as we have done for the a single finger, uh, for example, by using the um, sorrow simulator or the TMT design. And we also think about, we're, we're thinking about a mobile app development in, in order to allow the children to interact in a better way and to also have fun while um, performing the rehabilitation step. And also our um, complete big brain computer interface will be useful in order to better um, uh, allow into um, 
to the controller to give the right input to the pneumatic actuator or also tandem driven uh, globe in order to guarantee a better uh, accuracy of the deep movement. Uh, by also, uh, for example, we one can think about uh, uh, using a AI algorithm or a better mechanical design for the for the globe. And in conclusion, uh, the the stronger po strongest point of the this project is that it's very cheap and very easy to use because it's completely 3D printed and in, this allows to everybody to access this uh, mechanism. And so it can be used also for training at home and the children would have fun uh, using it. And also it could guarantee a parent-child uh, interaction and um, due to the easy and cheapness of the, of the sensor. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, um, and to the team, and also for staying within the time. Um, we can go ahead with the next uh, team. Next team should be Cobapos, led by Duran Raul Jimenez. Are you there? Okay, I can see you. And we can see also Hello. the slides. Hello, we can also hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, just... Okay, please start when you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raul Duran. Let me introduce my team. Uh, we are the Covapos uh, team. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, let me introduce also my teammates, uh, Francesca Nessi, a control engineering, uh, Ludovic Canini, a biomedical engineering, uh, Ascamano, a mechanical engineering. COPAPOS is an acronym to correct back position device. So we'll be going to be focused in the spinal cord disease. Uh, in also, we need to be uh, say like the, we are going to be focused in the scoliosis, ludopathic scoliosis for the implementation of this uh, assistive device. So let me talk about a little bit of the history to understand um, a little bit more. So the incidence of degenerative spin disease by the country, as we can see in this image, uh, we have a lot of in the area of Europe and also Italy, uh, Canada, and some parts of Japan. Um, so we want to uh, present uh, some alternative for these uh, conventional uh, braces for scoliosis. So as we have here, we can see like the a conventional braces are like plastic, uh, stiff plastic that the patients use for um, main like the correct uh, posture. And also we have some robotic spine exoskeleton uh, that they use for some experimental cases to see uh, how like the patient is uh, going through the, this kind of disease. So we want to also uh, be focused in the area of the shiles because we know as the scoliosis, it could not be stopped, just we can uh, stop a little bit the progression of the disease and we can give the child a better uh, way to live. So the concept um, for this, uh, for, for, or for, for a project, the concept of novelty was to uh, develop a soft actuated brace to help to reduce the progression of the idiopathic scoliosis and correct the posture for the child. Uh, as we know, we, we are going to be focusing the seat position at the beginning. So we want to correct the disposition for, for the shells and the cost angles that we need to be focused on working this one is will be from zero degrees to 30 degrees. If we have more than that uh, degrees in the, or the, in the cups angles, uh, we're going to need to go to the surgery. So for try to reduce the incidence of surgeries in youngs and like uh, teenagers, we want to start with this young age to kind of uh, start stopping the progression. So the name we here, um, we're comparing some uh, existing device with our proposed device and proposed design. So first we have like a, a common scoliosis brace. It's made with a hard material and it's a stiff plastic jacket that fits around the torso, as we see in the previous image. So the good pros that these one have is a custom made and help to stretch the patient. But the cons is like it's very painful and it's very expensive. One is like a five thousand uh, dollars to ten thousand dollars, so it's 
too much money and no, not too much people are able to achieve it. So the second one is the rows. This is the exoskeleton that we see in the previous image. So as you can see here, this one is more for experimental part. So this one offers the capability to sense and modulate the three dimensional forces applied to the torso. It also is a smart device. Uh, this is one of the pros uh, is that uh, they have adaptability. And as we say uh, before, modulate the three dimensional force of the torso. So the cons is not available for the market and also is uh, made for some pistons and metal structure. Uh, even if it's uh, uh, with some adaptability, we cannot like use this all day and also it's just for implementation of some test. And I'm glad to introduce here the Covapost device. This is a soft material device. Uh, is, we're going to try to develop a soft suite assistive back posture device uh, who have like adaptability. It will be easy to use, easy to carry. It will be also a smart device because we are going to implement some deep learning algorithms to try to train the device to help the progression uh, of the user and stop the progression of the idiopathic scoliosis. And we are also planning to use some uh, additive manufacturing process to use it as a low cost device. The cons is like we are not tested yet and we are not developing yet because this is just a proposal of that we are going to, we want to achieve in our future works. And this is very good because we want to do like the better quality of life for children. And part of the novelty is like, there are no devices like a soft devices for these characteristics uh, in the market already. So the outline that we have for this one, uh, we start uh, our idea with this concept art. This is the Coba Post first uh, design, a first idea. So with all the work that we have during this week, uh, we was able to achieve and put more clear the idea for Coba Post device as a future. First, we use the uh, virtualizing of soft materials to choose the material that we want to uh, use and implement for the uh, actuators, the soft actuators. We also have uh, we have some simulations used for the actuated soft link, and also we do the model for the soft robot with TMT DYN. So let me start with a Coapost device. Uh, here we have some uh, front side and back side with this cat uh, that we do with uh, uh, SolidWorks as a first concept um, design uh, in, in this engineering design. So you can see here some kind of actuators that will be implemented here, and also another ones that will be implemented here. And for a start, uh, and also it's like, because it's applying for a uh, child, we can see here like the model. So let me start with the cure fitting simulations for the 1.6. We choose the 1.6 uh, with the elastomer number three, and we compare with the MR money ribbling uh, two terms with the one term yield. So we have these simulations and we also use this method to uh, compare, uh, to, to see like the simulations with the TPU that is one of the desires uh, material that we want to use, uh, as I can mention before, because I, I mentioned before that we want to man, uh, manufacture in a additive manufacturing way using a 3D printers. So to take this data, we choose some, uh, we do some extrapolation TPU data. Uh, we take this uh, stress strain graph uh, for the stress strain diagram, and we use a web plotter digitizer for collect that data. Uh, once we extrapolate, we use this stress strain to create the simulation for stress and stress. And then we go forward for the source sim simulation. We use the 2.3 because this was like the most was uh, reaching our goal. Uh, this is a soft actuated uh, uh, links with some uh, like a drive and tendons. So that we use here is a static simulation and static simulation for bending along X uh, using two cables. We are going to use also uh, some actuators that will be implemented the same way. Uh, Obviously, we will change a little bit of the design, but this is like a kind of concept. And this is like the dynamic simulation that we have uh, along the C axis and along the X axis. And we also have like the dynamic simulation along the X axis. So continuously, we go and work with the workshop number 3.1 with the TMTDIN simulation. So do the time of uh, limit, do the delimitation of time, we, was, uh, we couldn't uh, show here the animation because if you see here, this one takes us like around three hours to from until now, and we wasn't like working uh, for the limitation of the equipment and another kind of errors that we have at the beginning. So 
this is like uh, we in, in this part we change like the diameters for the actuators that we want to show. We change also the density of the material because we are not using silicon; we are using another uh, material. We also change uh, like as we see uh, the first part of the tutorials in the workshop. Uh, they use some rigid links. We change for the soft uh, links. So this is like uh, our plots for the uh, work that we want to expect to to have. So let me talk also about a little bit about the design and control. So this uh, first schematic that we have for our idea, first the patient will have the first posture position and using another actuator, like this is like the inflate post that we see also in the, along the school uh, time. Uh, when we have the, this one will actuate it when the sensor that we implement, uh, like it will be like EMG sensors and also some uh, deformation sensor that will measure when, for example, the kid to this position or this position because ludopathic scoliosis and like the patients that they have this one, they will try to find the way to be in a position that is like not the correct one to be like more um, comfortable for them. So when they have something like this or something like this, uh, the sensing will start uh, like checking like the uh, deformation because we are also planning to use some like stretch sensors. So uh, this will be actuator and go into the original position. And using some deep learning algorithm, uh, we can use, for example, like CNN or another kind of method to measure, like, uh, train, uh, train the the device and go to the first posture position and measure if uh, we have like some progress or we are still uh, retaining the the progression. So and also all of this work will be hand by hand for the expert, like. Uh, physiotherapies, like some chiropractic and also some doctors uh, that they have a lot of knowledge in this area. So yeah, two this minutes. is like a table of, this is the two table for left. possible actuators. Uh, this is a photo for some actuators that we have, some advantage and disadvantage. We choose the, until now, the more that I like is the shape memory polymer. Uh, do, as I say, like a low cost and also eco-friendly and high elasticity defor deformable. And this is some possible sensor like EMG and piezo electrics and optical fiber sensor. So for measure like the muscle activity and also the, the formation. As a conclusion in future works, we have the first prototype of scoliosis in the initial phase. And this is uh, in, along this uh, uh, school, we, uh, and as we learn, we choose uh, correctly the materials and we are um, very happy with the results of choice, the TPU and the first simulation and the static and dynamics of the actuators. And a future work, we want to have uh, the manufacturing process, improving the design, choose the best uh, actuator and choose the best sensor and test and experiment with real patients to see the, how we'll be uh, implementing more uh, um, uh, improvements for our uh, device. So thank you for your attention. And I want to say also thanks for my teammates uh, to work hard with me and thanks to all. Thank you, Raul. Uh for the presentation and thanks to the team uh, also for staying in the timing that we stayed thanks a lot uh, it's time to move to the next presenter uh, it's time for miranda Lothar, leader of the the soft dangers team uh, hi um okay one second sorry just uh, showing my screen Okay, perfect. Okay, we can now see the slides. So you can start when you want. And Miranda, you're muted, I guess. Whoops, I am so sorry about that. Sorry. No problem. Um, I'll start, start again. Okay, okay. perfect. Uh, so hi everyone, um, I'm Miranda and I'm part of the Soft Engines group and today we're talking to you about a soft hand exoskeleton that will provide both assistance and tremor suppression for individuals with Parkinson's. 
And uh, here is uh, my lovely group, uh, Donatella, Christian, Alan, Brian, and myself. So uh, first of all, um, we were inspired by the talks from professors Johnson and Mazzaleni, uh, which highlighted the importance of prioritizing user-centered design and rehabilitation technology. And as a result, we decided to focus on creating a solution to aid those with Parkinson's. It's estimated that one to two people in every 1,000 people worldwide experience some varying level of Parkinson's disease. With the global population climbing towards 8 billion, this means that there is an average of about 11.7 million people affected. And a commonly defined symptom of Parkinson's is bodily tremors, with a focus primarily on the hands. Such tremors begin in the hands, working from the fingertip up to the arm, and shake at a frequency between 3 and 6 hertz while at rest. While this might sound like a relatively full, small frequency, it does cause significant interference with fine motor skills when performing daily tasks or rehabilitation exercises. Some solutions to this in, um, include functional electrical stimulation or FES, uh, but the, they affect a user's voluntary motion. And this is currently as a result difficult to implement for ADL or assisted daily living activities. In the next couple of slides, we'll take a look at different wearable design solutions for tremor suppression in hand exoskeletons, uh, though it should be noted that we are yet to find a solution that combines an exoglove for performing both rehabilitation exercises and ADL activities with tremor suppression, which is what our group is proposing. So, um, current soft robotic systems present a plethora of favorable features, including lightweight and wearable designs to allow for mobility and range while wearing, as well as soft and pliable materials to improve safety and hygiene. And as you can see, there are a number of designs that allow the same soft robotic principles while varying drastically in their use case applications. While multiple soft robotic exoskeleton gloves or exo gloves exist, however, there is minimal investigation into the absorption ability of the materials that we commonly use in soft robotics. Also, um, the only solution that we could find that was similar to our proposed design was a pneumatically driven vibration suppression exo glove, but a cable driven exo glove with vibration um, suppression um, would uh, be preferred as it would be more in line with its biological example. And as Professor Lashi highlighted, um, bio-inspired solutions will lead to more effective and robust designs. Therefore, we are designing a wearable exoskeleton glove solution for rehabilitation purposes by including passive tremor suppression elements um, and combining them with an exo glove uh, for motion assistance, um, similar to the work on, from Professor Cho. And we are also looking into using a TPU and 3D printing uh, manufacturing process to, approaches to reduce manufacturing costs. And our intent is to create a design where a cable driven exoglove has TPU inserted into critical points where tremors reach maximum frequency. And by using a vibration absorbing 3D printed material, the design would add passive suppression in while minimizing additional weight on the hand. Now we're going to talk about two different mod, uh, techniques for fabrication in exoglove soft actuators. The first is molding in which rubber like material is poured into a mold and then left to cure. Uh, basing on this behavior of the elastomers that we saw in workshop one, we base, oh, apology. On the left, you can see that the Oh, I'm so sorry. I think our, um, our, my notes have been moved slightly. Apologies. Um, so one approach is to um, pour in the um, elastomeric material into the mould as, um, as shown in these slides. And for this, you would need silicon spray, a mould, a mixing procedure, a vacuum pump to reduce to remove bubbles and an oven for curing. Um, and the, um, however, the issues with this approach is that um, a mold is required and it's quite difficult to create complex geometries, um, which as a result, um, another, another alternative could be 3D printing, for which no mold is required, you can create more complex geometries, and the objects can be created with different characteristics, all in a single print. Um, as shown here, we compared the elastoma data for the three materials from workshop one, and we investigated which models were best using the curve fitting toolbox in MATLAB. 
By comparing the stress and strain data for each of the materials provided, we decided that Elastoma 3 would be best as it would provide the highest amount of strain for the similar amount of stress uh, to Elastomas 1 and 2. And by using the um, MATLAB curve fitting toolbox, we decided that the five term Mooney Rivlin was the best fit. Um, after this, we looked into simulating a soft exo finger in the Soro Sim simulation toolbox. In particular, a cylinder of one centimeter radius and 10 centimeter length was designed, and the finger was divided into two different soft regions resembling the proximal phalanx and the distal. The finger was actuated by using four cables inserted into the soft material, two cables running down from the fixed part, the hand, the hand dorsum, until the proximal interphalangeal joint to actuate the abduction and adduction of the metocarpophalangeal joint, respectively. The other two wires drive the flexion and extension of the finger, and combined, all degrees of freedom of the human fingers um, are, can be separately controlled. A simulation of one of the exoglove fingers was carried out in our, the Sorosim toolbox, as I previously mentioned. Um, specifically, trapezoidal activation functions were applied to each cable to actuate the motion of the exofinger. In the simulation, the gravity effects were neglected, and the simulation results reported in the slide demonstrate how it is possible to drive the finger in the space. In particular, both of the joint space variables, the bending of the finger around the Y and Z axis, and the end effector position are reported in this slide. The same simulation was then carried out but with the change to the exofinger material. Specifically, TPU was used and the same actuation forces were applied to the cable. In the simulation though, as you can see, the exoskeleton finger is not bending and this is because of the increased stiffness in the material. However, as shown here, the finger was able to be actuated with increased forces, though as a result, this would, increase, this would require increased motor torque or stronger actuation and could increase the weight of the solution. Apologies. Um, we then did attempt to uh, simulate our solution in um, TMT9. And um, two segments of 0.045 and 0.55 meters were modeled where the material properties have been applied to the soft compliance segment. Uh, for flexion and extension of the finger, um, 10 newtons was exerted to the tip of the segment and for abduction and adduction, um, four newtons of force was applied to the tip of the segment. Um, we did apply the EBR model using the radar solver, however, um, and we look forward to further investigating the possibility of simulating our solution in TMT Dyne as part of our future work. Uh, we did also attempt to, um, let's quickly press play, sorry. We did also attempt to simulate our solution in SOFA. Um, and while it didn't work for us in the time constraints given, we did enjoy trying to use the software and look forward to using it in future investigations. Um, one moment, apologies. While the current solution requires material investigation to improve the actuation performance, we think that this could be um, implemented in other exoskeleton solutions in the future to aid tremor suppression elsewhere. Um, also, the use of passive tremor suppression elements means that such a solution can be used in more robust environments with less control co computation required. Additionally, combining tremor suppression with exoglove technology will greatly benefit those with Parkinson's while performing exercises uh, when made using cheaper manufacturing techniques like 3D printing. We believe our design could benefit people in varying financial situations, increasing rehabilitation technology applicability. Exoskeletons can also be used to improve physical performance, and we think that using, uh, including tremor suppression elements could help people stay in work while experiencing early onset Parkinson tremor symptoms. Finally, we believe that the um, tremor suppression would also reduce frustration in those with tremors using exoskeletons and exogloves, in turn decreasing rejection rates of such technology. Thank you for listening. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Miranda, uh, for uh, the presentation. You also saved a few minutes. Um, thanks to all the team. Uh, let's move to the next uh, presenter. Should be already there. Uh, it's the
team called Fujibots. Uh, and uh, uh, the presenter is uh, Alexandra Miller. So well, please uh, start whatever you want. We can see you and listen. You. All right, great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are the Fujibots. Uh, my name is Alex Miller. I'm presenting on behalf of my team. Uh, we are all from France, the United States, Japan, and Italy, hence Fujibots. Um, my teammates are Francois, Marco, Jian Chung, and Alessio and we are presenting the soft robot feeder. So of the world's population, about 15% of people are experience some sort of disability. And of that 15%, approximately 110 to 190 million experience extreme functional task difficulty, preventing um, positive outcomes in uh, doing activities of daily living. One of these activities is um, feeding oneself. And so here's a picture of a caregiver um, hand feeding um, this elderly woman. And you know this is uh, kind of a large problem. And what, what um, researchers have done is they have created rigid link robots to replace um, the humans in doing this. What it does, it takes the burden off of nurses, caregivers, et cetera. The only thing here is you see that this man is leaning quite far forward in his chair. And let's say you are you know, paralyzed from the neck down, this would be difficult for you to do. Here's a video from the University of Washington showing uh, an example of this. And here you'll see that he does lean forward a bit to um, get the food into his mouth. And so this would not happen normally with uh, a human caregiver. And so what our team proposes is creating a soft end effector in place of a rigid end effector to um, mimic the human hand more during feeding. So how this relates to the school topics. First, um, it's more of a biomimicry in that, again, we mimic the human hand. This could have psychological as well as functional impacts so that it is more natural and not so uh, rigid and robotic. Additionally, this could have um, good clinical impact as you know, creating more, uh, having more rigid, rigid um, bases and then soft end effectors in hospitals could re relieve the burden of nurses. And then finally in rehabilitation, this will increase independence amongst people who use these devices and hopefully improve their overall activities of daily living and independence. So as far as the assignments, we um, unfortunately weren't able to accomplish assignment three, but we look forward to doing this in the future. And um, we're very appreciative of the opportunity to have all these um, assignments. So for the first assignment, we use the first term Yeo and two term Mooney Rivlin to um, analyze the material. With this, um, we found that the R square fit of the two term Mooney Rivlin um, was more effective. And then from these, we were able to find the shear modulus and Young's modulus for um, choosing the elastomer. Um, here I'm just showing some calculations that we completed using uh, the two-term Mooney Rivlin to find the soft link properties accordingly that we later used in the second assignment. So here um, for assignment two, we based it off of uh, 2.3, which is more similar to our, our needs in, in uh, using the soft end effector. Um, here I'll just show a quick simulation, dynamic simulation of uh, what we propose to, to be at the end of the soft robot. So this would um, potentially hold the spoon or the fork. And um, in future, we hope to you know, create a more general uh, end effector to hold any utensil really. And then our next design steps, we were inspired by Dr. Michael Tully's um, talk with the bellowed tri-chamber actuator. So instead of having the entire base be uh, rigid, we hope that we could utilize a soft robot to sit on the table or even attach to the wheelchair to minimize the weight, increase the portability, and then hopefully make the experience more, more natural and more human-like. So again, with the world population 15% having disability, 
we hope that you know within this 110, 190 million, of course, we understand that not everyone has access to uh, the technology that we just showed, but we do hope that implementing a soft end effector will increase the um, increase the human-like uh, feeding and hopefully reduce some weight so that people can take it around with them as they go out to eat or something like that. So our team would like to thank um, the Soft School and all the sponsors and the organi organizers for um, giving, this, giving us this opportunity to learn and share. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, uh, very much for the presentation and to all the team. Um, it's time uh, now to move to the next team presentation. So uh, let's go to the presentation given by the next team leader, who should be Francesco Di Tommaso, Here with, I am. With, with his team at the Back Scratchers. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can Great. also see you. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes, perfectly. Great. So good morning, everyone. I'm Francesco Di Tommaso. I'm speaking on behalf of my group. We are team eight. We like to call ourselves uh, the back scratchers. And uh, for this competition, we, uh, we would like to propose you our project, uh, which we uh, named the OctoHelp, and you will soon understand uh, the reasons of these choices. Uh, this is the composition of our team. As you can see, we're spread all over the world, uh, from Italy, where Roberto and I are at the moment, to Serbia, where you can, where, where you, where you can find Maya, from US, uh, where you can find Cole, to Japan, when you can meet Abdul. Uh, our project arises from a simple but crucial observation. Uh, nowadays, we have been able to um, achieve a great goal, which is the uh, elimination or at least a, a wide reduction of the architectural barriers that uh, could affect the lives of uh, disabled people living on a wheelchair, sitting on a wheelchair. Um, so in an, in an open environment, they are basically able to do whatever they want nowadays. And also uh, motorized wheelchairs are uh, widely uh, commercialized and uh, um, uh, they, they allow uh, disabled people to move, uh, um, uh, let's say, in an horizontal direction uh, at the speed, at the pace they prefer and wherever they want. But uh, paradoxically, the situation changes dramatically when we consider an, a closed environment, for example, a domestic environment, a store, a supermarket, where uh, disabled people sitting on a wheelchair uh, still um, have difficulties in reaching uh, and grasping objects that are, that are outside of their range of motion. And uh, this is uh, paradoxical, if you want, because uh, in a closed environment, they might find more difficulties with respect to an open environment. So given the problem, how do we plan to solve it? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the subject can, can move easily in, in the horizontal direction without any limitation, but the range of motion in the vertical direction is, uh, is uh, uh, limited. So our solution is OctoHelp. OctoHelp is basically a soft robotic arm for assistance of disabled people sitting on a wheelchair that allow those people to reach objects that are, uh, that are outside of their, uh, of their range of motion. And uh, it can be easily stored in a backpack that can be mounted either on the back of the wheelchair or on the back of the subject himself. The uh, uh, OctoHelp is actuated by tendons and the grasping movement is uh, uh, obtained by uh, a simple wrapping movement of the distal part of the, of the robot, uh, just like the trunk of an elephant or the arm of an octopus. We were inspired in this project by some talks that we have uh, um, that we have enjoyed during over the last week, in particular the one by Dr. Yashui Shairata about the Moonshot program and the Nimbus limbs, as well as the uh, talk from Dr. Uh, Ryu Maniyama about the inflatable robots that uh, allows patient uh, or users to uh, execute uh, difficult movements, uh, but without having the um, the bearing of the weights of the uh, traditional rigid uh, robotic arms. 
the first step of the implementation of our project uh, consisted in choosing which could be the most suitable elastomer to uh, use to realize our device. So we analyzed the, the three proposed elastomers and we uh, decided that the best solution would be the elastomer that allowed us to, uh, uh, to have the lowest amount of deformation with respect to a certain amount of uh, to a certain amount of stress. And we figured out that the best solution would be elastomer two. So uh, having decided the elastomer, we moved on to uh, virtualizing the, this material uh, with a certain model. And we discovered that the best way to model our material was with the three-term Munili Rivlin model that exhibits, as you can see in the, in the plot on the right side of the slide, exhibits um, an R square factor almost equals to one, which is almost perfect for, um, for uh, an appro approxima approximation. The second step of our implementation was uh, uh, dimensioning the device. So we created a, uh, two, a two divisions soft uh, robotic limb. Uh, we respected the requirements that were specified in the assignment uh, with uh, the, the dimensions uh, as, as were specified. But we uh, decided to actuate the robot by not using a piecewise function as was suggested, but by using a sigmoid function, which allowed us to reach a smoother actuation of the robotic limb and of the divisions of the soft, uh, of the soft robotic arm. Uh, we respected the specifications that were required with respect to the, um, to, to the magnitude of the force. In fact, the first actuator reaches uh, 60 Newton strength, while the second actuator reaches 20 Newton strengths. And you can see that we have reported the formulas that we have used to uh, implement this kind of actuation. On the right side of the slide, you can appreciate the dynamic simulation that we have ran, that we are run uh, for the robotic limb. As you can see, the, the, R, the soft link is uh, subjected to a force on a negative y axis. And you can appreciate also a slightly uh, wrapping, a slight wrapping movement uh, in the distal segment of the robot, which uh, mimics the uh, uh, um, grasping uh, movement that we uh, aim to achieve. Uh, finally, the third uh, step of our implementation uh, um, process is uh, um, the uh, um, derivation of the equation of motion. This can be done by using uh, the toolbox TMT-Dyne, as we have saw in, as we have seen in, in um, Dr. Uh, uh, Sadati uh, talk. Uh, the, basically, we decided to uh, complete assignment 6, 3.6, because it was about concentric tube uh, robots, which are basically two tubes sliding one over the other. Uh, uh, there is an outer, uh, an outer tube that is uh, larger than, than an inner tube. The uh, body segments uh, uh, can be mm, uh, uh, the length of the body segment can be uh, uh, imagined as depending on the control signals from translational and rotational motors, uh, which is F tau, as you can see in this line of the code, while uh, we decided to use a reduced order modeling because it allowed us to uh, reach an accurate simulation with the smallest dimensionality. Uh, the Cartesian position of the point along the robotic curvature is expressed with the three translational states, uh, x, y, and z, by using the command dot translation, as you can see here, while uh, to describe bending around the x, y, and z axis, we decided to use the command dof that also sets the boundary condition. We found all these informations in the, uh, in the reference reported uh, below in the slide. Uh, one of the questions that we were asked in this assignment was how is the concentricity constraint enforced? And we, find, we, we found out that the concentricity constraint, uh, which is the tube's coaxial motion, is enforced by assigning tube two polynomial coefficients that are equals to the ones assigned to, to tube one, but only for the overlapping segments, as you can see in the codes that, are, that we reported in this slide. Uh, the last question we were asked is, how is the tube sliding captured? 
And basically, um, uh, I will not read the entire paragraph. Uh, I will just uh, uh, summarize it for you. Uh, in, uh, we found out that the, um, the sliding uh, movement can be set by um, uh, um, uh, changing the integration range for tubes two, which is the inner one, um, with respect to the, to the movement uh, of the of tube uh, of tube of the outer tube, uh, which is the tube two uh, tube one. Sorry. Um, uh, what could be the pros and the cons for our project? Well, basically, the pros is uh, are that the uh, system is usable by different type of motor uh, of a disabled patient, from um, people uh, that cannot move their legs anymore to uh, tetraplegic or paraplegic patients. But we will see a future development uh, later on in the in the following slide. Uh, of course, one of the pros could be the portability of the of the device because it can be easily stored in a backpack mounted uh, on the back of the wheelchair. Um, the control that is uh, allowed by the use of a joystick is very easy uh, to use, so it would be uh, affordable for any type of, of patient. And for sure, the use of soft materials allows us to um, guarantee the safety that is required for the interaction with human subjects. Um, for, for sure, uh, uh, that is needed with, uh, for the interaction with disabled patients. The cons, for sure, are the limited types of uh, grasping movement. Um, we would like in the in the in uh, in the future development to implement also a different kind of uh, of end effector. The unability to handle heavy up to lift heavy objects, and for sure, uh, we have energy issues uh, regarding the actuation of the system and the autonomy of the system. Uh, future development and next design steps of the project could, could be the implementation of a brain computer interface to allow also tetraplegic patients to use the device, but also the implementation of, of machine learning algorithms to control to smoothly control the, um, the movement of the system. As I mentioned before, one of the possible uh, future development would be the implementation of a different kind of an of end effector to um, uh, perform a better uh, grasping movement, as well as uh, defining um, uh, more limbs, as shown in the picture here, uh, and the use of real materials, because we have used uh, uh, materials that are not uh, actually existing. This is the team working all night long, but still happy to work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francesco and the team, uh, the night team. Um, and uh, yeah. Thanks again. Let's move to the next uh, presenter. Uh, I already can see her connected, Elena Bardi. Good morning, everybody. It's me. Uh, it's not going to be Radik because it has he has some uh, issues with the, the connection, so it will be me. <laughs> okay, perfect. So no problem. So, um, okay, uh, the, the team should be the soft club. No. Soft, uh, yeah, soft club. Yes. yes. Okay. Club and uh, the project is soft neck. Okay, so I was uh, uh, okay. uh, checking. Yes. Thanks. Okay, please Thank start you. when you want. Yes. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. I am uh, Elena, and my team is composed by uh, Radik, Andrea, Mattia, Denise, and uh, Nan. And as you can see, we come from very different uh, universities and places. And our project is uh, Softneck. So we will provide a short background on the problem and the idea that came out of it. And uh, then we will briefly describe how we made use of the workshop tools. And finally, we will draw some conclusions. So um, what we want to focus in this project uh, on, on this project is head stability. So head stability is very important in people with cerebral palsy, spinal cord injury, neuromuscular disorders, etc., because they may experience a disability in actually stabilizing and positioning the head. And these disabilities might lead to fatigue, pain, tissue contractures, posture deformities, impaired functioning, and decreased participation in activities of daily living. 
indeed had stability, has a very important role in many activities, in many physiological activities that are fundamental for a uh, correct way of living, which has breathing, swallowing, eating, independent mobility and performance of activities of daily living. The uh, social interaction and communication uh, had is the uh, place of the vestibular system. And moreover, it provides a stable frame or a reference for vision. Therefore, we understand the importance of head stability. So what is the concept? So we have a need. Our need is to stabilize and support the motion of the neck. However, nowadays, the technologies that exist are mainly passive, as we can see in the first pictures, or cumbersome and rigid, as we can see in the second picture. So even if it is actuated, it is quite cumbersome and rigid, and therefore it prevents to be comfortable. So what is the concept behind our project? We believe that soft actuators might be exploited to actively support the neck, improving on one side ergonomics and portability, but at the same time promoting control, alignment, and to uh, actively assist the mobility of the neck. Moreover, we believe that to make the device really suitable for activities of daily living, we should use uh, surface EMG signals to discriminate whether the movement is voluntary or not. In this way, if the movement is, the, is voluntary, then the device will support it. While if the movement is not voluntary, the device will prevent it and will, stabi will stabilize the position of the head. Therefore, uh, we will have uh, sensors, we will have two surface EMG electrodes placed on the splenius capitis muscle and strain sensors to detect the head position. The control strategy will be an EMG triggered control. So when the EMG is over a certain threshold, we will define the uh, movement to be voluntary. And we decided to use three pneumatic actuators, which allow elongation and bending upon inflation, such as, for example, um, the, the steep lock. So this is our uh, design. This is the, the, the design of the concept. So as you can see in blue, we place the soft actuators. So we have one soft actuator in the back of the neck and two actuators below the jaw in order to provide stability at least, and at least to support the motion for the flexion extension of the head. We have two surface, uh, electro, uh, two surface electrodes in order to collect the surface electromyographic signals and strain sensors. According, uh, regarding the positioning of the strain sensors, um, this should be thought carefully in order to find the best solution which allows to uh, evaluate which is exactly the position of the head. Uh, the idea is that uh, combining the uh, signal coming from the uh, EMG sensors and the strain sensors, we would be able to detect the intention of the wearer. So if we have EMG signals and a movement which, are, which can be combined to produce uh, a voluntary action, then the intention detection model will trigger the low level control to support the movement. However, if the EMG and the strain sensor are somewhat in contrast, then the low level control will decide to stabilize the head because probably uh, the, movement, the movement is not voluntary. In order to interface the actuators with the, um, with the user, uh, we have thought to make a kind of hybrid, soft, uh, rigid mechanical interface where the interface with the actuator is rigid while the interface with the skin is soft. So regarding the assignments, the first step that we did was to uh, model the properties of the materials used for the actuation unit. In order to do that, we uh, used the collected experimental data on stretch, stretch relationship, the one which were provided. And we uh, determine the analytical functions of the model based on the principal stretch ratios, as you can see in the slide. So we decided to use the neo who can model and the two-term mooney rivlin model. And finally, by comparing the uh, performances of, the two, of these two modeling uh, solutions, we selected the appropriate model to use, uh, to use for the design of the actuator. What you can see here is the result of the comparison. So the two models are actually quite similar in performance, but the two-term Mooney-Ridley is slightly better. 
And so we decided to um, use this uh, model in order to determine the characteristics of the material upon inflation. So uh, when the material is subjected to a stress, which can be provoked by inflation, um, it will stretch and it will uh, provide a certain mechanical behavior. Regarding, uh, regarding assignment two, instead we decided to consider uh, the beam uh, because we believed it could have been a nice aproximation of the inflated actuator with a transversal load applied to it. In particular, we, find, we found an analogy of this transversal load with the load applied by the head to the actuator. So the head might, might apply this, uh, this load because of its weight. And therefore, we kept the um, the, 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 the numbers that were provided by the, um, in the assignment, but we believe that this strategy might be useful also for uh, our application. And this is the result. So on the left, you can see um, the relationship between the force applied at the tip with respect to the deflection of the tip of the cantilever beam, while on the right, you can see a very nice GIF in which uh, we show the movement, so the 2D movement of the beam under the following loads. Regarding, regarding assignment three, um, we believe that this tool would be very useful in deriving the actuator equations of motions using the, the tool. And um, we wanted to focus on the first step of using the tool, which is to define the kinematic implementation. So there are four types of kinematic implementations available. The first one is the series rigid link in which each joint is defined with elasticity and damping for each of the six degrees of freedom of the link. The Euler Bernoulli beam with relative states, which poses a discretized model with relative states from the Euler Bernoulli beams, in particular relative because each coordinate is derived from the previous one. So the, the reference is the previous one. And so these two approaches can be, uh, can be considered similar to rigid link robotics. Um, instead, Euler Bernoulli beam with absolute states, it uses uh, Euler Bernoulli beam, but uh, it refers to a word frame and the general reduced org model instead exploits a polynomial series uh, to, uh, to uh, find out the kinematics. So these two models instead are similar more to a finite element mode uh, approach. Uh, the differences in the implementation were found in the robot section of the code. So the codes provided were quite similar to each other, but we found the difference to be in the definition of the, of the joints. So according to the kinematic model selected, um, some changes must be made in the code. And here you can see two examples related to the series rigid link and the Euler Bernoulli with absolute. Uh, and uh, uh, what we can see is that here uh, they define the first degrees of freedom and the process is repeated for all the degrees of freedom of the joint, while here um, the beam uh, must be defined. So the idea would be to try to use the, each model and to understand which one would be the most appropriate in terms of uh, uh, computational time, because we would like to use these results for um, to have a reference for a control scheme and in terms of accuracy, of course. And re reduced order model method seems to have the best potential based on the faster computation and the sensitivity to nonlinearities. Uh, finally, for the fourth workshop, we uh, just had an idea on how we could apply it. And uh, we thought that it could be uh, nice to use SOFA software to design the hard soft interface between the skin contact layer and the stabilization layer, so the layer of the actuation. In conclusion, we can say that the toolboxes can be exploited to support the development of a prototype that uh, we might use an already existing actuation technology we could, which could speed up the implementation and the development of the prototype. Um, the use of soft actuators, of course, overcomes the limitations brought by the rigidity of other types of supports. 
and the active, uh, so the, the possibility to actuate the, the device allows active rehabilitation and assistance with activities of daily living. For the future, we would like to make an ergonomic study to understand whether this device is actually ergonomic. We would like to increase the number of supported degrees of freedom and maybe rethink of the design of the actuator in view of that and replace the EMG intention detection with a multi-class intention recognition with machine learning techniques. So I would like to thank you for the attention and here are some pictures of the team working together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena, for the presentation and for uh, uh, the very good timing. Uh, thanks also to all the team. And uh, please now let's move to the next presenter. So we now expect to have a next team that is uh, room 10, if I'm not wrong. The presenter should be Michael Meinert. Yep. Okay, perfect. Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. And we can also see the slides. So. Please feel free to start when you prefer. All right, well, I'll go ahead and start now then. My name is Michael Maynard. I'm representing Room 10, that Room 10, that's our team name, as the uh, team leader, unfortunately for me. Just kidding. Uh, good morning, all. Let's go ahead and get started. It's just now about to be 5 a.m. here in the U.S. So we're presenting the Palm Free Exo Club. It's a similar take or design as uh, what we covered during this with Dr. Chow's. However, we're going to start with the the current problems as well. So availability, poor program retention, and cost issues are commonly issues that we've discussed and seen as we're gonna follow through the proposed solution to talk over our design approach, impact, implications, and future development. Um, <clears throat> so like I stated earlier, we're talking about a palm-based or worn, hand-worn exosuit. There's three commonly used or seen types of hand-worn exosuits. There's rigid link exoskeletons, which give the easy to control, typical force effectiveness in terms of transmission of force using linkages, mechanical advantages usually on our side. However, in most cases they're bulky and rigid. The next case is gonna to refer to our pneumatic actuated exoskeletons. That's another more commonly used type soft suit exoskeleton. And one of the first steps in development was gone this direction when we got to flexible type gloves and soft exoskeletons. They're easy to control because pneumatic cylinders are typically two states, on or off. They're very force effective because they can be customized and tailored to be direct forces and where they need to go. However, they suffer from poor portability due to the requirements of either a water reservoir, if they're hydraulic, or in the pneumatic cases, they require an air reservoir, such as an air tank or air compressor. Thus, they also face the issue of pneumatic cylinders are typically unidirectional. However, in some cases, all the requirements are more complex, it can be bidirectional. In the third case, which is the more, the cutting, I mean, the more recently developed and what we're seeing more and more people go towards is the tendon-driven actuated exoskeletons, much like we saw with Dr. Chow, I mean, <clears throat> Dr. Chow's. The tendon-driven actuators provide great portability, compactness in terms of what we can actually achieve compared to the others. However, they often come in the case of complex force transmission requirements, which is, you know, as we saw with other cases, requirement of Bowden tubes, remote force packs, et cetera. Our project concept is gonna be a derivative of the tendon-based cable-driven actuators. However, we're proposing a palm-free solution. By the means of that is, is we derive a way to route the tendons or the motor cables in a manner that does not impede upon the palm. Therefore, they travel across the back of the hand. Additionally, we're going to introduce a method that uses five <clears throat> that allows for separation of the fingers, so individual articulation of each finger, including the thumb, through direct control with individual motors. The reason for presenting these concepts is to allow for palm freedom in terms of promoting comfort, as well as allowing for the full use of the hand. By removing the palm from most things, we're removing a major portion of the actual hand's sensory feedback and built-in sensors, biological sensors. As stated in the previous slide, 
we found a method for routing the fibers through. And our mock-up we have here, a fiber glove, found a way that routes attendance that does not bypass or tra transition across the actual palm of the hand. Instead, it allows to travel along the side of each finger and then come across the back, which allows for easy fixing or easy fixation of the modal, I mean, a remote power supply, remote, I mean, and remote actuation unit via loading cables or direct linkage through a direct motor cable, motor cable at the wrist. Uh, in addition, for the extension of the hand, rather than be reliant strictly on cables, we're also adding a flexible element on the back of each finger that will allow for the extension of the fingers or promote the extension of the fingers, in addition to aiding any additional back drivable method for extending each finger. <clears throat> so the way we approached this project was implementing all three workshops into a method that developed our project further. Therefore, starting with workshop one, rather than recreate the previously assigned elastomers, we went out and got actual experimental test data from a variety of sources. In this case, we actually got from <clears throat> robust off paper that stated, that showed us the raw data needed for deriving the Neohokian model, as well as the two-term two Mooney-Rivlin model for Dragon Skin 10A. That is a smooth on product. It's a platinum, it's a platinum activated silicone. And that's what we will be using for the elastomer that will be acting as the extension element or the potential, uh, potential energy gain. Uh, as you can see here, we can see the many Revlin as well as the Neohokian equa equations driven based off of the mod model data we got. <clears throat> And we further compare this against the Yale three term as well as the Yogden one term and the Yale one term. And we found that the hook in from the, from the actual test itself, the, the hook in and the O term are both were valid. However, the hook in model provided the best one. Next for workshop assignment two, we use 2.3, the actuated soft link, much like everyone else has done so far. Um, <clears throat> however, we modified it to match and to be consistent with our actual system in terms of providing three divisions along our elastomer soft robotic link that would represent, represent the three different joints necessary for the finger to curl. As you can see the parameters we provided below, we also have further researched. I mean, we went to Dragon Skin 10A since the material we'll be using and using the material data sheets provided, you can see we have the my young modulus as well as density and poison ratio necessary to perform the simulations. <clears throat> Further configuration results we used here as well. And I'll go on and proceed to our static simulation results. For whatever reason, we were unable to recreate the static simulation results in the dynamic relation, I mean, dynamic results. So we are only providing the static results here. They all consistently came out correct. However, our dynamic results always directly, I mean, direct, we're direct contrary to what we were seeing here. Uh, but finally, workshop three, we were unable to actually get workshop three to perform in the way we would like it to. So we provided the workshop 3.1 results we got for the derivation of the EOM equations for the EVR model. <clears throat> you can see our results here on slide 11, yep. as well as the individual setups we followed. The change from the derivation of the EOM was <clears throat> simply going from full system to some small velocities. And that was an, an adaptation we made to try and make it closer to our setup. And finally, <clears throat> resulting to our final results here, we also explored three additional models. And we found that the, <clears throat> the other three models, the EBA was great for reduced water model, et cetera. All right. I don't want to run out of time. So for simplification, here's the modifications we made to this workshop assignment three that we were unable to get to proceed. But consider we consider the soft link is, I mean, is a cylinder rather, I mean, circular shape rather than a rectangular shape consistent with examples given by the speaker and the pneumatic chambers and negative pressure to assume them acting as tendons. Potential application for this is the assistance in a, a adult daily lives, as well as assistance for impaired patients, improved quality of life for permanently or permanently or progressive occupational diseases and injuries and in-home in rehabilitation. 
the use of the, I mean, we were looking for the goals as discussed previously of how to get this at home and help patient retention. <clears throat> Feature developments, palm free thumb control, a detachable mechanism for cleaning, integration of sen further sensors, implementation of, implementation of dynamic control systems and improvement of extension control mechanism, as well as universal sizing. Thank you for your attention. And these are the pictures of our group. I believe I'm about to exceed time, so that's it. Thank you, Michael, for presenting. <laughs> and uh, thanks uh, uh, for, for uh, the job also to the other members of the team. OK, unfortunately, we skipped the questions, but uh, thanks for asking. So let's move to the other uh, teams. Uh, I think that uh, Xing Su uh, should be next presenter of the music team. Let me ch check. No, uh, Kathleen Freeman. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> because I wasn't. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I received the email okay. from Maxine, but actually Kathleen is uh, is presenting. So okay, perfect. Okay. So hi, um, my name is Caitlin Freeman, and, and I represent a group of wonderfully talented individuals. Um, and we come from Mexico, the US, Italy, and Hong Kong. And so we say that together we make music. Uh, and today we will be presenting on a tendon actuated exoskeleton for scoliosis rehabilitation. So for some background, uh, scoliosis is defined as a 3D deformation of the spine, and it's estimated to affect around 2 to 3% of the population, which is a pretty significant proportion. And this condition isn't just limited to a simple curvature of the spine. It can actually impair musculoskeletal, respiratory, and neurological functions, which can cause a lot of pain and lead to surgery. Um, Moreover, it's a progressive disease, um, and it's most commonly idiopathic, which means that it can be really difficult to treat. And if you don't have intervention early and often, then you may require surgery or you may have medical complications. So the most common uh, rehabilitative procedure for scoliosis is called thoracic lumbar um, sacral orthosis, or TLSO, which is a three-point pressure system. Um, and so if you look at this, this is an example of it on the right, um, which is most commonly done using a brace, which has a three-point pressure system um, in order to decrease what they call the Cobb angle, which is a measure of how progressive or how progressed the scoliosis is. So when we're looking at current um, TLSO uh, solutions, the most traditional TSLO braces are very rigid and uncomfortable. Uh, and so a lot of the users don't really like them because it tends to interfere with their daily life and it decreases their mobility. Um, and so because of this, innovations have been developed to create more compliant braces as shown on the picture on the right. Um, and these are more comfortable and provide more mobility to the wearers. And so they end up preferring them. Uh, but these passive systems have been found to be less clinically effective. Um, and so because of that, some researchers have developed more active systems, but that are still compliant. Uh, like the one shown in the middle. And while this does increase mobility, uh, it has a really bulky profile and heavy weight and short battery life. So it really makes it undesirable and impractical at this moment, um, especially considering that these braces are intended to be worn for the majority of the day. Um, and so we decided to create a more compliant TSL, uh, TLSO system for added mobility, but we wanna introduce a hybrid active passive model and soft actuators for increased clinical efficacy. So we started with our problem definition, uh, where we found that there's a need for innovation in scoliosis rehabilitation. And once we defined that, we began reviewing topics we learned in soft tech school. Uh, and we wanted to see what we could apply from what we've seen by the lectures. And we were really inspired by a lot of the ideas that we saw, particularly those of the passive systems, embodied intelligence, and cable-driven soft actuators. And so from these and our work in the workshops, uh, we decided to develop a tendon-actuated exoskeleton with hybrid active passive control. And um, so um, oops. let's uh, look at the workflow uh, for our project implementation. So the first challenge was designing the soft actuator. So to begin, we used the first workshop to derive the elastomer properties. 
And then in the second workshop, we modeled the effect of the cable actuation on the elastomer. And in the third workshop, we were able to come up with a model for the Bowden cables. Um, and then once we had designed the soft actuator, we uh, proposed um, a system to uh, fully model it in SOFA. Um, and then we also came up with this concept on the right where we combine uh, rigid elements with the soft actuator in order to get that corrective force uh, where we need it. So first for the uh, soft material selection, um, we first looked at the materials that uh, we were presented with in the workshop and we compared them to what we see in the literature of soft robotics. Um, and we found that the second elastomer was the most similar to dragon skin, which is a very commonly used uh, product in uh, soft robotics and it's commercially available. So we decided to go with the second material. Sorry, it's frozen a little bit. Um, but while that's loading, I can uh, continue to describe uh, that there are uh, many different models that you can use to model this hyperelastically. Um, and in this uh, workshop, we learned how to do that. Um, and we were able to find uh, that compared to, um, uh, we were able to compare the uh, three Mooney three-term Mooney Rivlin model to the three-term uh, Yo model uh, and found that the Mooney Rivlin uh, more accurately represented that relationship um, because it had a higher correlation and it had a decreased error. Um, and then from these models, we were able to derive properties like the elastic modulus and the shear modulus, which can then be input into um, the models that we use later. Um, and then in the second workshop, we decided to solve workshop 2.3 in order to model soft material actuated by a cable. So we changed the actuation profile slightly um, and decided to ignore gravity because we wanted to investigate the elastomer's ability to conform to the shape of the human thorax. Um, so then we were able to, uh, to model this dynamically and, and found that this did have the properties that we desired. Um, then as an added challenge, uh, we decided, we were also curious about um, this toolbox's ability to help us determine cable routing and actuation profiles uh, for our desired corrective force. Uh, and so we created a phantom spine uh, where we divided it into nine segments to mimic scoliosis. And then we applied cable actuation to get our desired deformation profile. Um, and so hopefully you can see here um, that we can get that uh, desired three point corrective force. Um, then we moved on to workshop three, where we were tasked with explaining, um, in 3.6, we were tasked with explaining uh, the concentric tube robot um, and how it was modeled using the TMT Dyne uh, continuous modeling framework. Um, so first they used a reduced order model, um, specifically they used polynomial shape parameterization in order to come up with 24 different polynomial functions, which can then be combined um, in order to put them through the continuous framework, uh, which is based on Newton's third law and the principle of virtual work in order to derive an, uh, a relationship for the actual backbone curve of the entire system. Um, and so then we were able to simulate the results of that. And we were trying to figure out how this could be related to our um, model. Uh, and so we looked to the con concentricity constraint and the tube sliding. Um, and we thought about how, where we would see a cable or a tube moving inside of another tube. And then we realized that this would actually be appropriate for a boating cable. Um, and so specifically, we could use the reduced order model and shape parameterization in order to model um, and analyze the friction of the cable moving inside the tube for a boating cable. Uh, finally, we would like to use SOFA as a way to simulate, or to simulate the entire system. Um, and so to do so, we can integrate um, open source musculoskeletal thoracic models or even phantoms of these models uh, with our CAD model of the rigid frame and then combine that with our soft actuator. Um, and if we put that into an entire system, then we can hopefully get a deformation analysis. And our objective is to see a 20% reduction in the Cobb angle. And if we would see that or something similar, then we would consider this a success. So for application and uh, feasibility, we have proposed this exoskeleton as a method for scoliosis rehabilitation, 
Um, but it could really easily be applied to other spinal deformities, uh, such as kyphosis and lordosis. Um, and then certain aspects of it could also be adapted uh, for general postural support um, to increase stability, decrease pain, and um, assist in mobility uh, for people uh, that have trouble um, uh, with the stability of their thorax. Um, but in order to determine the feasibility of this product, um, first we would have to um, fully define and create the tendon drive system and the mechatronics um, and create a plan for the fabrication, which we would like to do with 3D printing. Um, then finally, we would have to uh, experiment and compare our results with the models. Oops. Um, and then in the future, um, we would like to make this as a passive active hybrid system. And to do that, we would want uh, sensor feedback um, and include passive uh, elements and locking mechanisms. So the point of this is really to have embodied intelligence in our, uh, in our design. So we really want to uh, take signals from the environment to see when our user is, for instance, trying to lean over to grab something or if they're sitting down and we would wanna introduce Slack into the system um, so that they don't have to be fully actuated at all times. Uh, we would also want to introduce locking mechanisms to hold the tension in the system um, so that it doesn't have to be fully actuated all the time. And this would really help decrease on the power usage um, and decrease on the weight of the entire system. Um, and then in a bigger picture concept, uh, we are really inspired by uh, Professor um, Yasuhisa's um, vision of the future and the role of AI robots with humans. Um, and so we would really like this to be part of this entire framework of creating um, a world where we have uh, AI robots uh, that can interact with humans in order to empower them. Um, and so we can uh, create more devices that can help with rehabilitation and assistance of the people that need it. So in conclusion, thank you guys so much uh, for watching. Uh, we really enjoyed doing this and um, yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, thanks to the all the team. Um, so I think uh, after thank uh, all these people uh, from from this uh, music group, we have to move to the last uh, presentation. So let's move to the Memac team and team leader is uh, Mattia Presenti, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I can see him. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can also see your presentation. So please uh, feel free to start when you want. That's great. So hello. We have some problems with Matthias connection, I guess. So let's wait a moment. I don't know if uh, the other members of the team are there and can contact Matthias separately, just to advertise him that uh, the connection was lost. Okay, I read in the chat that uh, he was uh, informed already, so let's wait uh, a bit. Okay, in the meanwhile, I no problem for the inconvenience, it may happen, of course. But in the meanwhile, I'll, I just uh, uh, want to recall to everybody to upload the presentation. Uh, Matteo uh, contacted you to, to do so. 
So please, uh, for the groups that uh, did not uh, uh, share their presentation so far, please Hello, uh, upload it as soon as possible. Yes, Mattia, we lost okay. you. <laughs> but yeah, now... I'm sorry, my connection decided to drop just <laughs> in the early moment. Okay. I so I'm sorry, okay, I'm so going to share again my screen. That's common practice, no problem. It may happen for sure. So <laughs> yeah, we please. are used to that. I I I think. Okay, so please go ahead. Thanks. So I'm starting over since I just started. Hello again, I'm Mattia, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about our project called Steer Soft Exosuit for In Water Rehabilitation. Our group name is Memac, and it's made out of the initials of our first name. So again, I'm Mattia, I'm the team leader, and today I'm going to talk about the work I have been doing with Manuel from Colombia, Enrica, that she is from Italy, as I am, Amy from the US, and Chai Chan from Thailand. Here is the outline of today's presentation. Let's start with some background. In water rehabilitation has several benefits compared to traditional rehab, especially after knee or hip surgery. It removes the burden of weight support from the patient. It allows to maintain uniform muscle tension during movements, which favors muscle recovery and flexibility. It also increases confidence in movement execution, mainly because it removes from the, from the patient the fear of fall. It also facilitates the execution of movements and exercises that would be not possible outside, the, outside water. In the literature, there is no um, study about active assistance to in-water rehabilitation. There is just some studies about modeling this kind of uh, procedure after knee or hip surgery. So our idea is to provide active assistance to patients that perform in-water rehabilitation. And this is to overcome drawbacks of such procedures, uh, such as the increased inertia and increased um, viscosity of water that may require uh, higher force to perform motions in water. We found, as I mentioned, no record in the literature about active devices for in-water rehabilitation. Traditional techniques, as we can see in the picture on the slide, consist of manual movements that are performed by the therapist. This also requires some effort and puts some uh, stress on the muscle skeletal system of the, of the therapist that has to support the weight of the patient. Our approach, on the other hand, consists in using a soft exosuit for in-water rehabilitation, providing a soft and gentle interaction with the patient with no need for restructures. We also believe that soft materials are more suitable to be used underwater. Here is the concept of our device. We designed a soft system that could be integrated in a diving suit and uses two tendons, each made of two actuated cables. We also integrated two inertial measurement units that will provide motion data for the control system, as we will see in a bit. The electronics and the actuator can be put in a backpack that is worn by the user and the patient in this case. In this way, it helps remove the weight uh, from the uh, leg that needs therapy, and also it remains above the water level. As I mentioned, we will exploit inertial data to detect the motion onset from the patient. This is very important for rehabilitation because it lets patients put some effort into the initial phase of the movement, which is crucial. Then we can exploit kinematic data to track the range of motion of the knee, as well as to monitor the speed of motion execution. And this could be also uh, used to track the performance of the, rehabilit the rehabilitation procedure. We also would like to uh, provide assistance as needed, and this would help uh, modulating online the torque provided by the DC motor that we can see here in the slide is coupled with a slider for tendon elongation. And this is what uh, generates the actuation of the device. We can see this uh, more clearly, I hope, in this control scheme of our device that implements the functionality I have been uh, telling you about. We can use the error between the desired uh, position, that is the uh, knee joint position, and the measured position uh, to uh, modulate the torque that is provided by the motor and hence the deformation. 
we can then use the inertial data and a Kalman filter to reconstruct uh, the knee angle and then have our error for the control system. Let's see how we connected what we learned during the seminars and um, uh, exploited the tools that were um, shown to us from these the workshops. Uh, so we started with workshop one and that um, was used to select the material for the actuation system. And in particular, we, sim we simulated several elastometers to pick uh, the one with both the best characteristics and the simplest yet most accurate model possible so that it could be easier to integrate such model in the control system if required. Here we can zoom on the results and we can see that um, the first elastometer and the five term Mooney Rivlin model provide um, a young modulus of around two megapascals in this region, uh, which is um, which confirms that the results of the simulation are compatible with the um, data shown for elastometers. Then we have used the results of the first uh, workshop with the Sorosim toolbox to simulate the kinematics of the soft link. Here you can see in the slide both the um, parameters as well as some pictures uh, of, the, um, of the device. Uh, you can also see that it's made of two SMA cables that are actuated. In the bottom right corner, you should see the force profile that we applied during our 10 second simulations in the toolbox. Here we can have a look at the results of such simulations. You can appreciate that we had to play around with some of the parameters uh, to achieve the, um, the motions that would be required to induce deflection of the knee. Uh, we also uh, realized that there are still some parameters that need some tuning, for example, the force time profile, but due to time constraints and the quite long time that each simulation required, we could not uh, run such uh, new simulations. So finally, we exploited uh, what we learned during the third workshop the, um, to perform some simulations with the TMT dynamic. I think unfortunately we, we lost again Mattia. Okay, Mattia, now now you are can you hear me? Okay, okay. Did, did you miss something? Do I need to repeat? Uh, maybe 10 seconds more. Or okay, so um just to tra transition again, we use TMT Dine to um simulate um our um actuation cable with different values of lambda to study the cross-section change due to the elongation of the cables. Let us conclude with some final remarks and I hope my connection will uh, stay with me for uh, another two minutes. Um, so um, about uh, potential and impact, we believe that such a device could have quite a large and uh, beneficial impact since it would extend the population that could benefit from in-water rehabilitation and also reducing the burden on therapies that is uh, nowadays have to support the weight of the patient and uh, manually provide assistance to them. Visibility of the project looks good since we have seen aquatic robots also during this um, seasonal school and the technology required for the implementation control system is fairly simple. Uh, next, I guess we would start from improving our simulations, especially um, um, exploiting what we learned during workshops two and three and also simulate human biomechanics and interaction with the device using software, for example, like OpenSIM. Next steps would be, of course, prototyping the device and optimizing its parameters uh, with the goal to reach uh, testing with uh, LT subjects and then patients. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And again, I'm sorry for the connection issues. Okay, thank you. Anyhow, even you had some problems you still was in time perfectly so 
thanks to you and to the other member of the teams. So, uh, thanks uh, to all the groups for uh, being uh, in the time. So we are perfectly uh, on schedule. So we will take some time uh, together with the other members of the competition committee to wrap up on your presentation. So let me thank all the teams for their very nice work. We really appreciated uh, uh, your ideas, uh, your effort uh, in uh, solving the um, assignments for sure, and also uh, your effort in finding uh, a fil rouge among uh, what you learned during the workshops. Uh, and we also could uh, uh, appreciate that you could uh, be inspired by the talks uh, uh, of the thematic speakers. So we are uh, really happy of your works for sure. Um, and yeah, I think that will be quite hard to, to choose the winners and to, to provide the scores uh, for the final uh, prizes. But yeah, we will do our best. So um, if you don't have any uh, questions, uh, we uh, will take uh, some time and we can uh, give you uh, uh, the, the final uh, uh, results uh, in one hour from now. So let's uh, uh, see you uh, later at half past one for the uh, final award ceremony and for the uh, final presentation by um, Professor Zollo and for the greetings and the conclusion of the school. I don't see any uh, questions, so okay. Let's update in one hour from now. Thank you to all and bye-bye. Uh,